When an engineered virus nearly kills all of humanity, the remaining survivors must struggle together to survive, all while a supernatural figure threatens their continued safety. Mother Abigail laments about the dark days looming over humanity's future. The dark man grows stronger, and not all will survive. Mother Abigail predicts that soon, the Dark Man will rise to destroy everything, as the survivors must head west to make their stand, as that is God's will. In the town of Boulder, Colorado, men in hazmat suits open a church littered with flies and corpses eaten by maggots. One of the men, Harold Lauder, runs outside to throw up. The body crew leader, Norris, comes up to Harold and reassures him that there's nothing to be ashamed of, as he too has never seen 7 billion people dead. However, Harold feigns being fine. Continuing to dispose of dead bodies in another house, Harold spots another guy, Teddy, taking movies for everyone to enjoy once the power returns. Satisfied with his pick, he leaves Harold behind, staring at a magazine. That evening, Norris lauds everyone for doing the dirty but important work of removing dead bodies in the zone. If they can't handle the job, they should speak up so Norris can find a replacement. Harold shoots his hand up without hesitation when Norris asks who will be returning tomorrow. The world's ordeal began five months earlier. Harold lives in Ogunquit, Maine, and he spends time spying on a slightly older girl named Fran. Fran's dad is tilling the garden, coughing heavily when Fran hands him water. He asks about Amy's bridal shower, which was a disaster. Fran wants to talk about something, but hearing him cough and feeling his fever, she thinks it's best for him to rest. As the two head inside, two guys seize Harold and throw him on the ground for secretly watching Fran. One accuses Harold of being a school shooter who reads his manifesto in class and got suspended for it. In the struggle, Harold breaks free and bikes away, but the guys pursue him. However, by the beach, a raven distracts Harold, and he tumbles over. His pursuers arrive and threaten him if he comes to that neighborhood again. They're disgusted that Harold's peeking at Fran. As they leave, one guy sneezes. When Harold heads home, people shoot him mocking stares. Over the radio, the main governor is considering a ban on public gatherings thanks to the early flu season. Harold arrives home, discarding his destroyed bike outside. Inside, he hears his mother coughing, but his attention is drawn to the pile of mail. One of them is a rejection letter from a publishing company, and blood drops onto it. Passing by, he asks his mom and finds she and his dad, who is on the way home, are feeling horrible. His mother is relieved and asks him to clean up after Amy's bridal shower. Walking past Amy's room, Harold lies about getting injured from his bike, but she calls him a terrible liar while crying about her bridal shower. Entering his room, Harold nails the rejection letter to a pile of other rejection letters. He discovers his laptop was shattered earlier, and he destroys it in frustration, earning Amy's ire. That night, Harold cleans his wound while news of a Texas area being quarantined rings from the radio. Later, he takes Fran's photo and pleases himself. Elsewhere, in a Texas Army research facility, Stu sits in isolation with guinea pigs. Dr. Jim enters and introduces himself, noting Stu's been held for three days. To sustain his cooperation, Jim entertains Stu's questions. Firstly, Stu isn't infected as the guinea pigs are fine, so Jim isn't wearing a mask. However, the other guy Stu went with, Mr. Campion, had the super flu virus everyone calls Captain Trips. Back then, Stu and other men were playing poker at a gas station when Campion's car lost control and slammed straight at them. Stu concludes Campion was a soldier when Jim refuses to say who the guy was. Instead, Jim recalls Stu's discharge from the military thanks to a knee injury. Stu recounts how the military in protective gear picked him up in the middle of the night. Now agitated, Stu asks about the other people who came into the facility with him. But he's devastated to learn that all of them got infected except for Eva Hodges, his friend's daughter. The government's doing its best to contain the spread by quarantining Arnett, Texas, and finding out who else Campion exposed. Back at the accident scene, Stu opened Campion's car and recoiled from the smell. He then extracted a convulsing Campion from the vehicle with the help of his friend. Campion asked about his wife and kid in the back seat, also talking about a lockdown and how he thought he moved fast enough. Talking back at Jim, Stu reckons Campion came from some bioweapons facility. He says Campion must have traveled long distances and exposed too many people. Jim's curious why Stu never got infected, so they'll test his blood and scan him so they can protect everyone else. As Stu hesitates, Jim mentions Stu's dead wife, who was a nurse. He asks Stu what he thinks his wife would tell him to do, and begrudgingly, Stu accepts to undergo tests. As a nurse takes Jim's place, she sneezes, making Stu skeptical. In Ogunquit, Harold bikes across an empty town, calling out to everyone. Around him, people are slumped on their seats, dead. When he visits Fran, he finds her digging a hole. Happy to see her, he steps back and pretends to call loudly to ask if anyone's alive. 
Friend hears him and sighs in relief, responding to his call. Harold moves excitedly to the fence and asks to come inside. Fran's digging a hole to bury her dad. She asks about Harold's family, but he, fortunately, has managed to bring them to a funeral home where they'll lie unburied. Rebuffing Fran's optimism that someone will bury the dead, Harold thinks the government is responsible for what's happening. He offers to help, but Fran snaps at his insistence, reminding Harold she's not his babysitter anymore. Before leaving, Harold says no one's coming. Once Harold is gone, Fran goes to her father's room and pins his war medals on her father's shirt. She tries wrapping him in bedsheets, but the fluid sack in his throat unnerves her and she falls back, horrified. Meanwhile, Harold finds a police car and opens its doors, gagging at the stench. Braving the smell, he reaches over and grabs the policewoman's pistol. He aims and smiles at the gun he now has before he spots a typewriter in a damaged establishment. Over the radio, the president assures everyone that the disease isn't universally fatal and calms fears that it was engineered by the government. At the same time, Fran struggles but manages to bring her father down to the hole. As the president coughs, reading a speech, Fran buries her father. As Fran sits alone that night, the power dies. She then finds herself walking through a cornfield, haunted by the sound of a giggling child running through the plants. She walks and eventually arrives at a clearing where a black doll sits on a pile of leaves. When she reaches down to it, an old lady, Mother Abigail, shows up and invites her to Colorado. Then, Fran awakens to howling winds outside her window, realizing she just had a dream. Harold, meanwhile, is furiously typing. In the facility, Jim enters Stu's room and wakes him in the middle of the night. They're moving him to Vermont because a nurse's kid tested positive. Outside, Jim introduces him to Dr. Cobb, a brutish doctor. During the drive, Cobb hands Stu a hood to conceal the location because the facility is classified. Irritated by Stu's incessant questions, Cobb reminds Stu that they have other means to make him cooperative. This shuts Stu up and he willingly wears the hood. As Harold brushes his teeth, news about the dire situation is spreading. The newsman, coughing, declares the disease won't be his demise, and he shoots himself. Harold briefly pauses upon hearing this. He rehearses his lines in front of a mirror. He'll ask Fran to leave Ogunquit with him as they're the last ones alive. Harold acts like it's a date, all dolled up as he prepares his things to leave. In the Vermont facility, Stu is confined somewhere deep underground in a controlled fortress run by a four-star general named Starkey. He and Jim are discussing things, all while they're being monitored through security cameras. Stu asks about Cobb, but Jim warns him not to antagonize the man because he's dangerous. Though Stu thinks he can take him, Jim switches topics and confesses he's also stuck down there with Stu. Jim has to leave to call the World Health Organization for estimates regarding the Captain Tripp's pandemic, but a flash of worry washes over Stu's face when he hears him cough. Dashing in his slicked back hair and polished shoes, Harold bikes to Fran's house and knocks. Hearing no response, he knocks again, calling Fran. Concerned, he steps inside and finds flies all over. Upstairs, he hears running water from the bathroom. Harold warns Fran he's coming in, and when he does, he finds the girl lying unconscious in the tub with bottles of pills scattered on the counter. As Harold pulls her out, Fran weakly mutters something about corn. Harold shoves his fingers down Fran's throat, forcing her to throw up the pills. That night, Harold plays music and hands Fran something to drink. Suspicious about how Harold arrived in time, Fran thinks he's spying on her, but he just wants to show his plan. In response to Fran's resignation to fate, Harold reminds her how she stuck the nail in his room when she was his babysitter. She did that to encourage Harold after he received his first rejection letter. Although Fran feigns ignorance, she admits to remembering that moment. Until now, Harold has put every rejection letter on that nail, and he hasn't given up. Because everyone is dead, they can't lose anyone else. Fran realizes they're the future, so she relents and asks about his plan. Knowing the virus's fatality rate is 99%, Harold thinks of venturing to the CDC's base in Atlanta because they might be running tests on immune people. Fran recognizes it's a great idea. Harold scoots over, and though Fran appears uncomfortable at first, she leans on his shoulder. Deep underground, Stu wakes to the sound of a crying baby and sees a field of corn outside his window. He crawls into it and rushes until he arrives at a clearing where a red-eyed wolf stands growling at him. Stu soon wakes up from his dream, only to find Jim, who looks the worse for wear, inside the elevator. Jim jokes about how it's a rule for epidemiologists to never be on the wrong end of the stethoscope, and now everyone in the facility has contracted the disease. Although there are reports of other immunes, there's nothing confirmed. Jim laughs at the ironic thought of how everyone was worried about Ebola just a month ago. Stu consoles him and asks what he can do, but to Jim, he'd rather give up and take his own life by a blade or by overdose. Worried about himself, Stu asks what's going to happen to him. 
Jim reveals General Starkey has sealed himself in the command center and is fickle with authorizing movements between floors. Knowing he can't offer Stu useful answers, Jim just hands him the blade. As Stu guides him to the bed, Jim laments how he thought he'd be the one to end the disease. Just then, Cobb arrives with a gun, looking terrible. He orders Jim to leave, but Jim's delaying tactics annoy him, so he shoots the guy dead. Quickly, Stu responds by slashing his throat and Cobb stumbles aside, dying. As Stu stares in horror, he hears the door chiming open. A voice from the intercom beckons him to come over. Picking up the gun and closing Jim's eyes, he goes to the hallway where he's instructed to follow the lights to an elevator. Then, the voice tells him to get into the elevator but leave the gun. When the elevator opens again, Stu finds himself in the command center. Footage of death and chaos fills security screens. Standing amid them all is General Starkey, who turns and says they're the last man standing, and in his hand is a gun. Stu admits being surprised that Starkey didn't shoot him the minute he arrived, but Starkey assures Stu that Cobb wasn't his subordinate. Instead, he beckons Stu to sit in front of him. Starkey reveals their last contact with the outside was two days ago. Cobb probably was just following contingencies, to kill Stu to keep it a secret. As Starkey stands, Stu asks if he has orders to kill him, but Starkey denies it. Instead, he shows Stu the book his daughter gifted him, which he never opened until four days ago when he learned she had died. Since then, he can't put the book down. He tells Stu he's proud of his soldiers for staying disciplined far longer than their models predicted. Despite Stu's horror at how the higher-ups game the apocalypse, Starkey reminds him the national government must continue. It'd be too naive to think no one else is doing the same thing. Starkey gives him his final instruction, take the key card and use the emergency stairs to reach the surface. Then, Starkey asks for a favor. If anyone asks, tell them the general held this post to the very end. Before letting Stu go, Starkey asks for one final indulgence, and he reads a poem from his daughter's book. This haunts Stu as he runs outside and finds dead people everywhere. As Stu arrives at the surface, he remembers how Starkey bid him goodbye and shot himself in the chest. Back in Ogunquit, Harold spray paints his and Fran's names and their plan to head to Atlanta on a wall. At the same time, Fran just stares in silence. When he's done, he rides his motorbike and wears his helmet, looking at Fran to make her wear hers. Starting the engines, they drive away, leaving the dead Ogunquit behind. Returning to the post-apocalypse time, excavators are being used to bury the dead. In his spare time, Harold philosophizes about pride and hate, considering them as great human virtues, for embracing them is a noble act. He thinks changing the world for one's good is a great adventure he's embarking on. At the dump site, Teddy almost falls into the hole, but a masked Harold saves him. During that moment, he contemplates erasing his accumulated hate and just accepting what was. When his comrades praise him, Harold wonders if he can change into someone new. Later, Harold sits with Teddy, as the guy talks about the drive-in he plans to open up at the amphitheater. That time, Harold wonders about letting go of all past pains. However, he knows it conflict with whatever life he imagined for himself. At that moment, he imagines himself haunted by his old, hate-driven dreams. As he stands to meet a wolf, a shadow emerges from the distance and approaches him, Randall Flagg. As Randall hands him a bewitched black stone, Harold wonders if he could be a prince out west. Harold then wakes next to the typewriter the next day, thinking about his dream. In front of the mirror, he strikes poses like the guy he saw on the magazine cover. Afterward, Harold smiles and meets Stu and Fran, now a couple. Harold listens close to Fran's pregnant belly. Stu asks if he's off to work again with the body crew and says he appreciates what they do on the front lines. Harold fakes happiness and reminds Stu they're all in this together. However, his contempt briefly betrays his facade. Before they leave, Fran invites Harold to come over for dinner sometime. When Harold returns home to the typewriter, he screams and vows to kill Stu. He also thinks of killing Fran too. Back on that fateful night, Private Campion received a call from a general asking if there were elevated readings on his end. He wondered if that was an exercise, but the general said no. Just then, a woman in a protective suit slammed on the observation window, her throat inflated. Campion asked the general to hold as he stood eye to eye with the infected woman begging to be let out. Campion peppered her with smoke and the lockdown initiated. Campion found the door was jammed and prevented from closing. He made a split-second decision after seeing the photo of his wife and kid and he bolted. As he left, the door closed, not knowing it was jammed by Randall. Campion fled as the facility locked down. He arrived home and hurriedly woke his wife, Sally. Taking her and their child, they drove away in a rush. Randall Flagg walked the streets that night. Campion passed by Randall, who was pretending to be a hitchhiker on the road. However, as Campion drove past him, Randall suddenly sat by the baby in the back seat. 
smiling eerily at Campion through the rearview mirror. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.